Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Hope you had a good couple of days, or a weekend actually. It was an entire weekend and end of a week, which I guess is a couple of days. Anyway, I hope it was good, and I hope you're ready to continue with Open Rocket because that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, we spent the last class going over a fair amount insofar as the UI was concerned, but we didn't actually get to making anything. So we're probably going to get started on that and uh, poking around at it and, you know, getting comfortable with it. And then we'll uh, probably start, you know, looking at the, the, the results and everything like that. But go ahead and get Open Rocket open. Huh. And you should be looking at this screen. Sorry, I need to grab some water there. As you can see, we've got our rocket name, cleverly dis um, cleverly picked as rocket, I guess. I wasn't really sure what I was going with that. But anyway, um, oh, all good. No worries, Jean-Marc. I understand. But yeah, so um, just as a quick recap of what the UI looks like, uh, we've got a list of rocket parts over here. It's a tree style uh, list. It includes stages and components and subcomponents. Um, the tree style list means it's easy for us to drag and drop whole parts of the rocket and reorder them either in stages or in uh, you know component subcomponents with other components in case we you know created the wrong thing. Um, we can add new components by clicking the buttons over here. Most of them are grayed out because they have specific requirements beforehand. So if we do like the body tube. As you can see, we get a whole bunch of different options that open up. Like we can add fins, different kinds of fins. We can add um, launch lugs, uh, stuff on the inside. Uh, that's what I'm going over right now is, is basically I'm spending a little bit of time reviewing what we did last class. Uh, but it was all this open rocket. And uh, I was actually getting a link for you right now. There you go. Um, but yeah, so all this stuff uh, ends up becoming selectable because we created a part, a component that uh, can be connected to these things, like a centering ring needs a body tube, a bulkhead needs a body tube, an engine block needs a body tube, uh, the re various recovery things need body uh, a body tube. So, <laughs> nice. Um, that's why those are grayed out, because you need you need the requisite parts in order to be able to add those. But as you can see, we've got nose cone, body tube, and transition so far. Then there's also fins and anyway. Then down here, as you can probably see when we start adding this stuff, this is going to be uh, sort of a layout of your rocket. Um, we can rotate it using this meter over here on the left-hand side, this little sliding bar. Rotate the, uh, the rocket. <laughs> really, the only way we can tell it's rotating is because the fins are rotating. But otherwise, this looks I identical all the way around. We can change the type of view so we can look at it from the back. Uh, we can look at a 3D model of the rocket or a uh, sort of a more true to life representation of the rocket, 3D finished. As you can see, this is what the like the final rocket would look like. It's not really painted or anything, but hey, whatever. It looks like a I don't know, some kind of like a Nerf rocket or something. Um, go ahead and bring the side view back up. Now, this also brings up another point, um, which is something, again, I touched on uh, in uh, in the last class, but I do want to, to sort of go over it again and then spend some time discussing it. Uh, I'll spend some more time discussing it later on when we're actually building these uh, rockets in open rocket but we've got two little circles here that exist on the rocket now that I put down parts um, 
we've got this blue and white circle sort of cut up into quarters and you've got uh, blue and white alternating and then you got a red circle. The blue and white circle represents uh, the center of gravity. Basically, um, you can think of it like the balance point for the rocket. If you were to put your finger there, like under, like a, let's say right here, that's, that's a, So if you put your finger there, you could actually have the rocket balance on your finger um, because the weight is evenly distributed uh, between both ends. It's not always perfectly balanced like that, but generally things that do a very good job of balancing, um, they're balanced around their center of gravity. So the center of gravity is sort of the, the midpoint of the distribution of weight. Now an interesting um, little side effect of that is if you throw an object, it will travel in an arc about its center of gravity. So as you can see here on this hammer, the center of gravity is somewhere near the head of the hammer. Throwing the hammer causes the hammer to, um, to spin through the air about its center of gravity. So the arc itself is traced by the center of gravity, and then the... Uh, um, the uh, sorry, the arc itself is traced by the center of gravity, and then the the hammer sort of resolve, revolves around it. Now, the other um, circle, the red circle, is the center of pressure, which is the point at which lift and drag act on the rocket when the rocket isn't moving straight up. So, anytime the rocket has a little bit of wobbling or something like that, and the fins need to correct it, and the nose, you know, the nose cone works to correct it, it will rotate around this point right here. So we've got where it rotates around based on its weight and where it rotates around based on its um based on its uh aerodynamic properties <laughs> we'll go over that later liam um so you've got two basically uh pivot points on the rocket depending upon which force is acting upon it now these work together in order to make your rocket more or less stable so it's the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure uh, is uh, sort of how you can determine whether or not your rocket's going to be stable. You want to make sure that the center of pressure is about one to two calibers behind the center of gravity. And you might be going, well, what's a caliber? Well, a caliber is simply the diameter of the rocket at its thickest point. So if we draw this line here, trace in between these two ends. And then we go back to the side view. I mean, obviously we can't see it because, you know, I can't really move this this little uh, measurement line here. But we'd want, you know, like the center of uh, the center of gravity to be, if it were here, we'd want it to be about about this far away from the center of pressure and in front of the center of pressure. That's the other important part. You want it to be in front of the center of pressure. Center of pressure should be behind the center of gravity. Otherwise, um, it's just, it's, the rocket will tumble uh, as it's going up, which is bad. Um, it will increase the, uh, the force as it, um, making it sort of rotate as it, as it begins to rotate. So, yeah, you want it to be about one to two calibers. So, if you were to trace this back um, about the same distance. So, you could have, at the furthest, you could have the center of pressure that far away from the center of gravity, which is decently far, but you want it generally to be somewhere in this area, generally. So anyway, that's just a little sort of minor treatise on uh, rocket stability. So now that we've done that, as you can see, is that if I delete the fins, the uh, the center of pressure just goes flying forwards way in the front of the rocket, and uh, you know we kind of want to avoid that. 
put on some trapezoidal fins, the center of pressure becomes right at about where the center of gravity is, which is not really ideal either. Uh, as an example, here's an example here. You've got the center of gravity and the center of pressure. Um, with the motors in, the center of gravity is about 163 centimeters away from the front of the rocket, and the center of pressure is about 182 centimeters away from the front of the rocket, which means given it's the diameter of the rocket at its thickest point, its stability is about 1.35 calibers, which is good. It's within that 1 to 2 range. The crowd of Lenny's. Um, without motors, though, the center of gravity moves way forward because there's a lot more weight around the, uh, the front of the rocket at that point, which means that the center of gravity moves up to about 135 centimeters from the front of the rocket. Bam, right there. Which means that its stability becomes 3.38 calibers because the distance between the center of mass and the center of pressure becomes much larger, which is not ideal. You don't want that. Um, the rocket becomes, well, essentially too... It's the, the drag and, and uh, wind resistance and things like that become too effective on changing the rocket's path, and you start getting overcorrection and wobbling, and it's, it's a bad time. This says simulation listener example. It's the name of the rocket. Mine's called rocket. That's the name of the rocket. Yours is probably going to say rocket as well, because it's the default. Uh, yeah, then we got the rotation slider. Oh, yes. Then we got apogee, max velocity, and max acceleration. Um, apogee is the highest point in the rocket's flight. Uh, max velocity is the fastest that the rocket goes during flight. And max acceleration is the fastest that it is going faster during flight. Right. Kind of a silly way to put it, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, these are all NA because uh, we don't have a rocket. These are still NA because we don't have a motor. Um, even if we put a motor in there, there will probably still be NA until we at least run one simulation so we know exactly um, how high the rocket goes and how fast it gets there and stuff like that. So model rockets have different interior components than those found in high-powered high rockets. Um, the aerodynamics, though, are similar at slow speeds, which is why our rockets still look like the big ones. Um, to start off, we'll use a pre-built rocket that's included by the program in order to view these parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to File, and then Open Example, and then a simple model rocket. And it will bring up a simple model rocket. And the designer is Sampo Niskanen, quite the name. Um, but here's a very, very simple model rocket. It looks pretty, um, looks like there's a, there's a few things going on, but it's, it's really not too bad. Um, as you can see up here, the name, a simple model rocket. We've got a length of 42.5 centimeters, a diameter of 2.5 centimeters. Look from the back, yeah. Um, since we've already run a simulation with this, we know it's apogee and it's max velocity and it's max acceleration. Um, it's going to go at its highest point, 314 meters up, which is all oh, about a thousand feet, roughly. It's about a thousand feet in the air, which is pretty high. Uh, its max velocity is 94.8 meters a second, so it's going one, f almost one third the speed of sound at its fastest point. As you can see here, Mach uh, 0.28. Uh, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. So when you're talking about high speed things, you tend to, you know, refer to its speed in terms of Mach. So you can go, you know, Mach 2, Mach 3, Mach 4, um, or in this case, Mach 0 0.28. And its max acceleration is 183 meters a second squared. So every second uh, that is under maximum acceleration, it is going 183 meters a second faster. Obviously, as you can probably guess, it doesn't do that for very long because its max acceleration is much, much higher than its max velocity. 
if its max acceleration is 183 meters per second squared and its max velocity is less than 183 meters per second, it doesn't even spend a full second accelerating at full velocity, or uh, excuse me, at, at max acceleration. So clearly there's a very short period of time that this rocket is spent under max acceleration, which is probably when its engine is firing. So I wasn't really kidding when I said that the engines on these rockets don't tend to fire for very long. In fact, most of the time the rocket is spent uh, most most of the time the rocket spends uh, ascending, it's spending that time coasting. At least for smaller model rockets. Larger ones, uh, different story. But smaller model rockets certainly uh, spend most of their time just sort of coasting upwards because they're so light. And proportionally speaking, the power coming out of those little tiny engines is, is just ginormous. So it just shoots up in the air. Anyway. Um, We've got a few different little symbols that are on the inside here. We can spend a moment looking at those things, but otherwise this is more or less a sort of a straightforward representation of a rocket. We've got the nose cone here, we've got the body tube, we've got some trapezoidal fins, and we've got a launch lug. As you can see, the, uh, the center of um, uh, the center of uh, gravity is in front of the center of pressure. But it's even not very ter like it's not terribly stable. As you can see, we've got 2.41 calibers, so it's a little bit outside of our range of stability. Um, it's possible, maybe, um, that this is still workable since it's not a one-size-fits-all situation in which you want to have it to be about one to two calibers behind the center of gravity. However, it's possible that we could actually improve the design of this rocket by changing the motor configuration or something to that effect, you know, maybe sticking a heavier motor in it or, you know, making the nose cone smaller, who knows. But anyway, um, this is what we're looking at right now insofar as the very simple model rocket is concerned. Uh, and we've got a bunch of different parts. As you can see, nose cone, pretty self-explanatory. Got a nose cone so that it can, um, you know, not be a, essentially just like a flying tube. Um, and then you got the body tube and the body tube is where basically everything else is attached to it. We've got the trapezoidal fin set, which is what represents the fins on the back. Um, we got the inner tube. There's another inner tube inside of our body tube, which contains the engine block, which is what holds the engine, also known as the engine mount. I was referring to it as the engine mount in our previous uh, uh, presentations. This is just another name for it. Uh, engine block, engine mount, same thing. Uh, insofar, uh, like as far as model rockets are concerned. When you're referring to a car, an engine block and an engine mount are two different things because we just got to keep things confusing. But anyway, um, when we're talking about model rockets, engine block, engine tube, same thing. Or engine mount, excuse me. And it could be that this is actually referring to... Eh, whatever. Anyway, uh, we've got a centering ring. And another centering ring, and these are basically just keeping the uh, the engine mount in place. There's a shock cord. As you can see, it's highlighted this this uh, sort of black dotted area with the wiggly line. Uh, that's just an abstraction meant to represent the fact that the the nose cone is attached by a shock cord to the inner tube, um, or rather that the shock cord exists. I'm sure if we were to double click on this, yeah, you can see here uh, shock cord material. Uh, override mass, override center of gravity, uh, all this good stuff. Then we got a parachute, which is the red one with the, uh, what well, looks like a light bulb, but that's actually a, a parachute, a dotted line diagram of a parachute. We got some recovery wadding here in order to protect the, uh, the all of the recovery materials, and launch lug. Launch lug is a child of body tube because it's attached to the body tube. But yeah, so this is um, a representation of a rocket. Now, in order to uh, to touch on the point real quick, Liam, um, if you double click on one of these things and go over to appearance, you can change how it looks. So I'm gonna have a wonderful fuchsia rocket. And if we go to uh, 3D finished, it's not going to show it. Why is it not going to show it? I spent all that time. None. There we go. We gotta get rid of the de the texture, and now we can see the uh, 
representation of the rocket. Anyway, very important stuff, incredibly important stuff. But you could affect the uh, the look of your rocket by by uh, changing values in appearance when you're working on your own. So anyway, this is our very simple model rocket. Let me go back to the side view. This is our side view rep representation. So as you can see, the sustainer is in the first stage of the rocket. Um, and uh, just, you know, keep that in mind for later. But all of these parts that we have here uh, are all parts that are that are just completely, like these are the bare minimum in order to build a rocket. You know, we don't necessarily need the trapezoidal fin set, but we need a fin set, whether it's trapezoidal or elliptical or freeform or tube fins. So we need a fin set. We need an inner tube. We need an engine block. Uh, we probably could use some centering rings. We need a shock cord. We need some sort of recovery system. Uh, we need some sort of recovery wadding. We need some sort of launch lug, some sort of body tube, and some sort of nose cone. Whoops. And they all need to be in the proper order, too. But anyway, um, all of these things are necessary in order to have a functional rocket. We can't really get away with, you know, not having um, one of these. So that's just so you know. Yeah, the nose cone is a requirement for aerodynamics. The body tube contains all of the stuff on the inside of the rocket. The fins keep the rocket stable. The inner tube keeps the interior parts, like the engine, in place. The engine block keeps the engine from destroying the interior or the engine mounts, like we were explaining before. And the centering ring adjusts the inner tube to accommodate the motor's differing size from the body tube. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically, we could stick a, you know different size motors in here. Um, these centering rings will automatically shrink or expand in order to fit that motor inside of the rocket's uh, body tube. Obviously, within reason, we're not going to be sticking a, a Class G motor in here because it's going to be too big to fit inside of the rocket's body tube. But, you know, you could you could move between potentially A to, you know, Class D, and um, I think those would probably fit inside of this body tube. And those centering rings, which you know, just represent the same kind of, you know, sort of spacers you'd put inside a rocket, those will automatically adjust themselves and become larger or smaller in order to uh, keep the rocket, the engine mount, snug inside of the rocket. Shock cone keeps the nose cone, the body, and the parachute connected when the, fi the engine fires, the parachute deploying charge, or the ejection charge. We already knew that. Launch recovery system, um, so that's the parachute or a streamer or whatever. Uh, the wadding insulates the in interior parts and so on and so forth. The launch lug keeps the rocket straight on the launch pad. We all knew that stuff. So now that we've seen that, we're actually just going to recreate it from scratch. So let me go ahead and close this one. No, I don't want to save it. And this is going to be, we're going to use our blank rocket design um, in order to create a basically a recreation of it. Um, so that we can go through how to, you know, add all this stuff and what we might want to do. So if we go, we'll start with a nose cone, uh, like you do. You want to make sure that uh, you start with the nose cone because the, the, the tree over here, actually, if we put the body tube first and then we put the nose cone, Watch what happens to the body tube. The body tube turns into a sort of straight line, and everything gets kind of messed up. Now we can reorder it, put the nose cone at the top, and then it, display, uh, it displays itself correctly. But uh, let's just save ourselves the headache, and we'll just uh, you know add the nose cone first. So if we do that, we get this window that pops up, nose cone configuration. Um, and uh, from there, we can provide some general uh, uh, parameters for the nose cone setup. As you can see, it's floating over here. If we change the shape parameter, we can see it update in real time. It actually becomes kind of, almost kind of a convex sort of shape. 
uh, as opposed to a concave kind of shape. And we can watch the center of pressure move around as we do that. It moves closer to the center of gravity. Uh, the nose cone length, you know, we can we can change that as well in order to provide a uh, a different sort of um, obviously shape to the nose cone. Base diameter, we can adjust how thick the nose cone is. And wall thickness, we can adjust the thickness of the wall that makes up the nose cone. What do I mean by that? Well, so the inside of this thing, obviously you're going to have the material it's made out of, but the inside of this thing is going to be empty. So if we adjust the thickness of this wall right here, it could be, you know, very thin or it could be decently thick. Um, if we adjust the thickness of this wall, we adjust the weights of the nose cone. So zero centimeters doesn't make any sense. We could do like 0 0.1 centimeters and suddenly we see that there's a center of gravity that appears. Uh, as we make the, the nose cone walls thicker, we see that the center of gravity moves backwards, just ever so slightly, but it does move backwards. And this is just because as the walls get thicker, uh, there's more weight centered in the back of the nose cone, which causes the center of gravity to move backwards. We can also make it filled, um, which gives it just, you know, the entire thing. There's no open space inside of it. And uh, our, uh, our center of gravity is placed on the nose cone. And then we can also change the component material. Now, the component material is going to affect the weight of the nose cone, as well as the, um, the strength of it. But as it stands right now, we're just worried about the uh, the weight of the nose cone. We can also change the nose cone shape. Um, there's just a whole bunch of different options, but we're going to stick with the, uh, I believe, the O guy for now. Yeah, basically, we're gonna we're gonna stick with the O guy, which is round tapered. Uh, we're gonna keep. The shape parameter of one, which is just just the regular looking one. We're going to set the nose cone length to be 10 centimeters. We'll see that update as soon as we move away from it. The base diameter is going to be 2.5 centimeters, so this is going to be a very long and thin nose cone, like you can see right there. And the wall thickness is going to be uh, 0 0.2 centimeters. So we're going to uncheck filled and give it a decently thin wall thickness. And we'll keep back on cardboard. Under shoulder and stuff like that, we can adjust just um, different... Uh, that's That's... We can adjust different parameters as they relate to um, the rest of the uh, the rocket, but for now, I'm not really going to worry about that. Uh, we can override the mass if we wanted to. We could make it heavier uh, than the um, um, than the uh, built-in materials and dimensions of the uh, the nose cone will have. So, like in case we decided to stick a weight inside of the nose cone in order to make it heavier to keep our rocket uh, stable, uh, that can't really be reflected um, in open rocket unless we use something like override mass, in which case we are just automatically, or we're manually, excuse me, the opposite of automatically. We're manually making the nose cone heavier in order to uh, keep a, an accurate representation of the rocket. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't done the body tube yet, um, but the nose cone, uh, these are the parameters you want. Um, but yeah, so I'll give you a second for that.
All right. So yeah, um, we can also override the center of gravity if we if we put the weight in a specific spot on the nose cone in order to make sure that the center of gravity is where it should be. Appearance, we went over that. We can make it a certain color or whatever. And comments, we can say, hey, you know, uh, adjusted CG because um, we're going to stick a weight against the back of the nose cone. Something like that, you know, in case you, you did something over here and like override or you're messing with the shoulder or general or anything like that and you want to make sure you know exactly why you did it you can play something in the comments so i'm going to hit close and that's going to be our nose cone if we you know we can we can check out the the wonderful 3d view of our nose cone look at that thing it's it's a nose cone it's amazing i'm sure you guys are are super proud of it anyway um these are all the parameters in order to create just sort of our general simple nose cone. Now, as you get more comfortable with it, you can mess around and create a whole bunch of, you know, there are the, the, the permutations and the possibilities are pretty much endless insofar as that's concerned. Um, you can, you can just create all different shapes and sizes of nose cones and, and uh, test out how they, they affect aerodynamics and everything like that. But as it stands right now, we're just going to go with a very simple one so you guys sort of know what you're looking at with the, with the, with the different fields and everything like that. Ah, I almost forgot. We have to change the nose cone material. We're going to change it to polystyrene. Boom. 1.05 grams per centimeter cubed. Centimeter cubed. And we are going to change some stuff in the uh, the shoulder box. So that's going to give us an additional little cap at the end of the nose cone, so that we can um, so that we can attach it to the body tube. So we'll go over to shoulder, hit end capped, and see if I adjust the length, I get this line out of here. If I adjust the diameter, you can see that it's actually the um, It's a, well, it's a shoulder. It's basically what you can use in order to attach the nose cone to the body tube. So for that, let's see here. Uh, we're going to have a diameter of 2.3. I was close. Boop. Uh, a length of 2, also close there. Boop. And a thickness of 0 0.2. There. Not only that, we've also adjusted the center of gravity. It's actually moved back a little bit because we've got all this additional material in the back here. So we've got a polystyrene nose cone uh, with these dimensions and with a little sort of uh, plug on it so that we can, we can uh, attach it to the body tube. Um, yeah, sure, okay. Go ahead and change the uh, appearance to whatever you'd like. I'm going to have a nice, um, let's see here, we'll just go with a plain white one, which sounds boring, probably is, but I think, can I have, and we'll have a fairly high shininess as well. We'll hit close, and if we go ahead and check it out in the 3D finished, see I've got this just stark white um, nose cone, and it's got the it's got the the cap on the end, and it's got uh it's got its its a uh, plug for the uh, body tube. So now we're actually going to add the body tube that connects to the nose cone. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And here we get our body tube configuration window. We've got general, motor, override, appearance, and comments. We're going to start. This component is a motor mount. Um, we're going to start with the uh, with the general. So we're going to make it a little bit longer. In fact, by a little bit, I mean 50% longer. So it's going to be 30 centimeters. And there we go. You can see it adjusts itself. Uh, the outer diameter is going to be 2.5. We already have that. The inner diameter is going to be 2.3. And the wall thickness is going to be 0 0.1. And as you can see, when I adjusted the inner diameter to be 2.3, the wall thickness automatically updated itself to be 0 0.1 centimeters. Because at some point, nicely, um, at some point, we have to sort of stick to what's physically possible in the world. And if we have an outer diameter of 2.5 and an inner diameter of 2.3, 
our, our wall thickness can't be any thicker or thinner than 0 0.1 because where's the rest of that coming from? Where like we're, we've got an outer wall that's sort of floating impossibly far away from an inner wall without actually having any wall in between. And it doesn't really make any sense. So just keep that in mind. Um, there are many things you can adjust to your liking. The wall thickness, the inner diameter and the outer diameter. You can adjust two out of the three things. <laughs> Pick any two of them, you can customize them to your heart's content. The third one is just going to be taken along for the ride, though. Component material is going to be cardboard. As before, just like in you know all the other examples that we've had, it's going to be cardboard. And then we're going to go ahead and make it a nice blue color. Make it make it shiny. I don't know if I don't know if I want it to be shiny or if I want it to be not shiny. So let's see here. If we change the shininess and we bring it down, the mat is nice. I do like the mat. As you can see on the inside, it looks like um. Looks like regular old cardboard. That's gonna look like that until we get like the motor mounted and everything in there. So this is our wonderful, beautiful rocket so far. I hope you're proud of it. I'm pretty proud of mine. So now that we've got our um, our rocket tube and our rocket nose cone. We're going to add some rocket fins. So I'm going to click on body tube once. So it's selected. I got the red outline around it. I'm going to go back to side view. And I'm going to click on trapezoidal because we're going to add some trapezoidal fins. Now you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff here. we got number of fins and fin rotation and fin cant and root cord and tip cord and height and sweep length and sweep angle and blah, blah, blah. Um, don't worry about those. At least. Excuse me. Certainly not at the moment. Again, as you get more comfortable with this kind of stuff, you can start adjusting those number of fins. Pretty self-explanatory. Fin rotation is going to be, I believe, oh, let's see here. Ah, uh, yeah, it's going to be the the literally the rotation of the fins where they are relative to um, the the rocket body, which it doesn't matter in this case um, because. There's nothing really to rotate it relative to, um, but if you had like a couple of different sets of fins on your rocket uh, for reasons, like you had a really big rocket or something like that, you might want to rotate one of the sets so they're off set from another set of fins. You know, who knows? Um, Cant is going to be, as you can see here, the, uh, the fins have gotten a sort of uh, rifled sort of... Um, quality to them, which would make the rocket <laughs> spin like crazy as it's going into the air. That would be quite the thing. Um, we're going to keep that at zero, though, because we want the rocket to more or less just, you know, not spin like crazy and go straight up in the air. Uh, the root cord, if we adjust this, as you can see, it adjusts the thickness of the uh, of the uh, the fins closer to the rocket body. If we adjust the tip cord, it adjusts the thickness of the fins closer to the uh, the edge of the fins. We're going to go ahead and undo those, though. Uh, hold on. Let's just close this, delete these, and create a new set of trapezoidal fins, because I did not keep track of them. All right, 5 centimeters and 5 centimeters. Makes perfect sense. Of course, they would be the same thing. The height is how long they are. You can make them super duper long, or you can make them super duper short. Little tiny useless fins. We're going to have it stay at three centimeters, though. Sweep length. Basically, the it's almost just essentially like the angle. Keep 
at that at 2.3 2 though. And you can kind of mess around with these two and see how they adjust the uh, like the center of center of pressure and the center of gravity and all those things. Let's keep this at 35. There we go. Close enough. Anyway, uh, fin cross section. As you can see, well, probably it's not really show. Oh, yes. If we were to look at it from the uh, back view, well, you can't really see it here either. Mm, 3D finished. Well, it's meant to show you basically the what this part of the fin looks like. Well, it's not really updating. So we've got so we've got that. We're gonna click. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, fin cross section rounded and thickness zero point two. So we're gonna go ahead and select rounded. We're gonna make it zero point two. Let's see, that makes it a little bit thinner, um, but otherwise, just as it's meant to be. As you can see over here on our stability, we got 4.45 calibers. This rocket is super unstable right now, but that's okay because we don't actually have any, um, any motors in it or anything else like that yet. So that will, that will change as we adjust more things on this rocket. For now, though, let's go ahead and... Put on some fans. Now we got a, a nice purdy rocket. Two point five centimeters. Actually, we should probably do that. There. That did adjust the stability just ever so slightly. And that does it for our fins. So we've got our fins, we've got our body tube, and we've got our nose cone. Let's go ahead and add an inner tube. So we're going to click on body tube so it's selected, and then select inner tube. We're going to have a whole bunch of stuff here too, outer diameter, inner diameter, wall thickness, length. Again, same deal as the, the body tube. You can pick two out of these three in order to adjust, and the third one will automatically adjust itself because there are only so many things you can do within the realm of the physical world. Length uh, is obviously the length of the body tube, uh, the, the position relative to the, uh, the parent component, the bottom of the parent component. You can adjust stuff like this in order to, to make it sort of stick out a little bit more towards the back or be a little bit further inside of the rocket's body tube. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, we're going to have it stick out a little bit more. Yeah, all we're going to change is the length is going to be 7.5 centimeters, so it's going to be a little bit longer, and the plus, it's going to stick out 0.5 centimeters from the back of the rocket. So basically, it's it's embedded the same length inside of the rocket. It's just sticking a little bit further out of the back of the rocket. So we can have the, the, the motor clear the back of the rocket and not really like damage uh, any of this stuff from its, from its uh, backdraft, which is not really the correct word, but you know, whatever. Since we need motors to determine stability and the motor goes inside of the inner tube, let's add, go ahead and add motors right now. So we're going to click on this, the motor tab here, and we're going to say that this component is a motor mount. So whenever we, um, whenever we add a motor to this rocket, uh, we will mount the motor here. As you can see, we've got a motor overhang as well, so we could we could have the motor hanging out of the um, the inner tube. But we're not actually going to um, we are actually going to do that. So it's going to hang out 0 0.3 centimeters. So just a wee bit from the end over here. Ignition at automatic launch or ejection charge. Basically, that just means that um, if we had multiple motors, we could tell it when the, this particular motor was going to fire after launch. Um, 
we're going to set it to automatic though, since it is the launch and the ejection charge. It's the it's the the charge that we use in order to get the rocket off the ground as well as deploy the uh, recovery system. So we're going to go ahead and click close. Now we're going to go ahead and configure a motor for the rocket. So we'll go to motors and configuration, hit new configuration, and we get this configuration that's labeled no motors and inner tube, none, default, automatic, perfect. It's exactly what we want right now. If we double click on it, we get this, uh, this dialog box, and there's a whole bunch of stuff here, like a whole bunch of stuff. As you can see, it's a whole bunch of engines or motors or whatever. You've got manufacturers over here on the right-hand side. We can select different manufacturers. If you have a specific motor, like if you have a specific motor made by Estes, you can you know, unselect a whole bunch of these motors uh, and just have the Estes motors. So you can, you can find a motor that has basically the same impulse and everything like that as the one that you're... Um, you know, uh, is the one that you own. So you can you can get an idea of how high your rocket goes and stuff like that. We can adjust the total impulse to have a minimum and maximum value. As you can see, as we bring it down, the scroll bar. The, the watch the watch the gray rectangle on the scroll bar. So we bring it down. The scroll bar gets bigger, well smaller, which means that relatively speaking, the box on the scroll bar is bigger. So we're basically reducing the number of options that appear here, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. You know, we want to make sure that we're only looking at the stuff that's relevant to us. And then we got motor dimensions, which is, you know, the, the size of the motor, as you can see here, diameter 98 millimeters, um, almost 10 centimeters in diameter, which is pretty big. I mean, if we're speaking relative to this rocket, this starts at what, roughly zero. That motor, its diameter is almost the same as the length of the nose cone on our sam our, our little um, simple rocket, which is pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. That's just the diameter. Not to, nothing to speak of the length. The length is uh, 289 millimeters, a third of a meter. It's about a foot long. It's a big rocket uh, engine. And it's a K. We go up here to oh look at that there's an o-class engine that is almost a meter long that's a big engine there are a couple that are over a meter long one that's almost two meters long o-class engines are super big anyway So this is we can use these over here in order to sort of filter things out. We can show the details of a particular motor. Uh, we'll get into that in a second, though. For now, what we're going to do is we are going to select a particular type of motor. Now, remember, just as a bit of review, uh, the classification. So we've got the, the letter, which is the impulse, which is the average sort of, not really the average thrust, but it's the, the amount of power that the engine puts out. Then the, the number right after that is the average thrust, which is, um, you know, as the numbers get higher, uh, it's a higher amount of thrust, but the, uh, the, the motor doesn't last as long, right? So like the lower numbers, it's a weaker thrust, but it's over a longer period of time. And then the, uh, the, the final number is the time to ejection charge in seconds. So anyway, um, We already got that. We got a thrust curve, which just gives you a general idea of, um, you know, how much force it puts out. So if we were to look at this right here, this thrust curve, it means that when it's first initially launching, the amount of thrust that it puts out rapidly increases over time and then hits a peak and then very quickly decreases again until it hits like this 
nice, um, you know, plateau here and then goes down to zero. And this is all time in seconds. So it, zero seconds to 0.35 seconds. So all of this happens in a third of a second. We want to look at all these. This happens over the course of a second. Uh, it hits its peak at about, you know, 0.15 seconds and then puts out consistent thrust and then dies after a second. So anyway, um, if we were to look at this, this is a three. So it's it's not putting out a whole lot of force. It's six newtons of force, but it's lasting quite a while. It averages, what, about, um, most of the time it's spending putting out two newtons of force, but it lasts almost an entire second. Uh, conversely, our A10T here, it puts out 13 newtons of force, then goes down to one and lasts less than a second. So you get, you get the idea here. But yeah, so you can, if you're ever, you know, kind of curious, you can just check out these thrust curves just to see, you know, uh, how long the motor lasts and get a general idea of how much thrust it puts out over time. You don't necessarily need to know these exact numbers. Like, you don't need to go like, okay, so I need to make sure that it puts out three newtons of force, at least not yet. But you can look at it and go like, this one puts out two newtons and this one puts out four newtons. This one puts out more force. This one lasts 1.3 seconds. This one lasts 0 0.8 seconds. This one lasts longer. So, you know, you can, you can get a general idea of how they, of how they perform based on that. Now, really quickly, what we're going to do is we're going to pick an engine to throw into this thing. And um, we're going to, we're going to use that as our, as our default. So select under, what is, why can't we, okay, so the ejection charge delay is going to be three. Let's find the uh, Estes, so we'll go ahead and Estes, go ahead and clear everything else out. So, okay, we'll clear all, we'll select Estes, we'll bring down the total impulse to just A's, and here we've got an A8. We'll set the ejection charge delay to three, because we can manually do that, and we'll hit OK. So now we've got an A83, which is mounted inside of our motor mount. It's not going to go very far, it's not going to go very high, it's not going to go very fast, but that's okay. We're going to mess around with that on Wednesday. We're going to spend some more time messing around with motors and stuff like that. Okay. So, like I was doing before, I just have the Estes rocket uh, manufacturer selected. And over here on designation, I've got A8. Perfect. I select it by clicking it once. And under ejection charge delay, I just type 3. And hit OK, and I've got my A83. But yeah, so uh, actually that's going to do it for today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and See here, I'm going to skip the poll questions in favor of giving us some more time for question and answer time and stuff like that. Uh, and then, uh, so basically, you guys are more than welcome to uh, to head out if you don't have any questions. Uh, have a good couple of days, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Otherwise, I'm here if you have any questions about anything. And uh, 